All right, hi everybody. I decided to do a little video on the mole lab that you did because there was a good amount of confusion. And so I thought it would be helpful to kind of clear some of these calculations up before you guys finish your exam this week. Or if you're watching this in the future before you do um, the exam in the future. So the mole, what is the mole? The mole just stands for a number. It does not stand for a number of atoms necessarily. The word that you want to have in your brain when you think of the mole is that it is the number of representative entities. So the reason why I give this example in the middle is because it depends on what the mole is referring to. So if you are talking about a mole of people, that means you have that number, this huge number of persons. But if I'm talking about a mole of couples, so two people are in a couple, that means I have that number of couples. But the number of people would be this number times two, right? Because there are two people for every one couple. Okay, and then I give some conversion factors. So one mole for every, you know, this huge number, Avogadro's number, parts or representative entities. You can call it whatever you want, parts or representative entities. And then the next one is molar mass. So for every one mole, there's a certain number of grams for every chemical formula, um, every compound, every element that you are calculating for. And so what I would suggest is anytime you're doing these types of calculations that you keep all units showing. So you want to show all your units so you know what you're actually solving for and what you're canceling out. So let's go to some of the questions that had um, the biggest issues. So number three said if there were two moles of sodium chloride, how much mass would be present in the picture? So remember that in this picture, every substance that's shown is one mole. There's one mole of that substance present. So right here with copper, you have an element, okay? It's just Cu. It's monatomic, which means there's one atom in this chemical formula. Uh, for something like sodium chloride, it's NaCl. You have sodium and you have chlorine. So there are two atoms in that chemical formula. So that's something you want to keep in mind, that these don't refer necessarily um, to individual atoms. They refer to whatever is in the chemical formula. Okay, so let's look at number three. Okay, this is how I would represent number three. So it says in number three, if there were two moles of sodium chloride, how much mass would be present? Okay, so if you have two moles, I start writing down in my calculation whatever is given in the problem. So two moles. Now I want to know how many grams, how much mass. So this right here is called your uh, molar mass. And so this number, this 58.44 grams, I had to calculate that from the periodic table, right? So you should be familiar with that. I don't think many people had an issue with that. And so what you want to show is the unit that you're going to be solving for is going to go on top and the unit that you are converting from, so you don't, you don't want that to be in your answer, is going to be on the very bottom. So 58.44 grams for every one mole of NaCl. Notice this red line, that just means they cancel. So when you're multiplying anything together, if you have the same unit on the top as you do on the bottom, they cancel out. They have to be on opposite sides. So what does that leave you with? That leaves you with grams. So this gives me about 116.9 grams of sodium chloride. Now I just highlighted this right here to show you this is what's called my conversion factor. So if you scroll up to the top again, remember I gave you conversion factors. That's this conversion factor right here, mole per grams. And remember the number that you get for grams is calculated 
from the periodic table. All right. I think my voice is waking up just a little bit for us to do number five. Okay, so number five says, how many atoms are present in the beaker that contains sucrose? So here's sucrose. Now sucrose in this um, instance is not included with its molecular formula, its chemical formula, so you would have had to look that up. Okay. Well, what do we know about this beaker? We know that there's, there's one mole right? There's one mole of sucrose in this beaker. So I started out with writing one mole of the chemical formula, which is C12H22O11. Okay, then I'm going to write down some helpful conversion factors. This is the one that most people skipped. This is the conversion factor that most people skipped. And it has to do with not writing down all your units. Okay, so one mole of sucrose is the same as 6.022 times 10 to the 23, you all know this number, molecules, or you could have put representative parts. Okay, so why do I put molecules and not atoms? Because look at this formula right here. There are more than one atom present. So that means it's referred to as a molecule. If you have any chemical formula that has more than one atom present, then that means we refer to it as a molecule when we're doing these conversions. Okay, so I have this conversion factor that's boxed in blue, and then I have a second conversion factor. One molecule is equivalent to 45 atoms. Where did I get that? I just added all of these little subscripts together. It's the same thing as I did at the top for couples. For every one couple, there are two people. It's the same idea here. So most of you went straight from mole to atoms without taking into consideration how many atoms are in a sucrose molecule. All right, so the calculation would look like this. I start off with what's given in the problem. So the problem talks about what's in the beaker. We know that in the beaker is one mole of sucrose. Oh, that doesn't really work, let's zoom back out. And so then I take my first conversion factor. Now notice I put this number that's on the bottom, the 6.022. I put that on the top here because I won't, excuse that noise, because I want to get rid of moles, right? They're on opposite sides. I want them to cancel out. And then I have one more step to do. So I want to calculate the number of atoms. So I use this last conversion factor. I put atoms on top because that's what I do want to finally give my answer in. And then molecules do cancel and I'm left with atoms. Okay, I hope that clears up some of that confusion. Now last, most of you did actually better in this section, but I wanted to show one of the calculations. So balance the equation, we're good with that. This refers to the mole to mole ratio of whatever is in the equation. So that means I need two iron atoms or two iron molecules and three chlorine molecules to create two iron three chloride molecules. All right, or um, um, it, individual units. Okay, so let's just look at number four because I think this kind of covers any question that you might have from this section. So it says, how many grams of iron three chloride will form if one gram of each reactant is mixed? All right, so this is where most of you went wrong. You gave me two answers, but there should only be one answer. So you can calculate like I did. You have two lines of calculations, but one of those answers is your final answer. All right, 
So we start off with what's given in the problem. It says one gram of each reactant is mixed. So I start with 1.0 grams of iron and 1.0 grams of chlorine because those are my two reactants. Separate calculations. They'll give you two different numbers. All right, if I wanna know how many grams of iron three chloride will form, that's gonna be what I'm solving for down here grams of iron three chloride. So I basically need to fill in the blank. You know, what is going in between that process? So this entire worksheet is focused on the mole, which means that we're gonna use the mole in almost all of these problems to solve for our final answer. All right, so I have grams right here. Well, I want to get to moles. Moles is the focus because moles is what brings this equation together and allows us to convert from one substance to another substance. So what did I do? I took the molar mass of both iron and chlorine. So you should see that the grams will end up canceling for both iron and chlorine. Okay, now this is, the next step is really the focus of this worksheet and that's using mole to mole conversions. Okay, so I have moles of iron at this point left. Now I wanna get into moles of iron three chloride because I'm trying to solve for grams of iron three chloride. First I have to go to moles. I can't go directly to grams of a different substance. That's like going apples to oranges. Okay, so I look at my balanced equation. I see that there are two moles of iron three chloride here and two moles of iron here. So I make that into a conversion factor. I want to cancel out moles of iron and convert into moles of iron three chloride. Yes, they're the same number, so it ends up can the numbers end up, end up canceling, but that's not the same situation for chlorine. Notice there are different numbers for the moles of iron three chloride and the moles of chlorine. Then after that, moles of iron would cancel and I would convert for my last step into grams of iron three chloride, again, using the molar mass. So what I've done here is I've used the molar mass at the beginning and at the end. The first step was using molar mass of iron because I started with iron. And the last step was using molar mass for iron three chloride. They're just flipped, right? In the first scenario, I'm converting into moles, so moles are on top. And in the final scenario, I'm converting into grams, so grams are on top. So you're using the same conversion factors really this whole time, except you just have to be aware of what goes on top and what goes on bottom. So I left this one blank just for you to check what your number is, but your final answer is just gonna be the smaller one between the two. And some of you put this, it's based on your limiting reactant, you know, whichever one is limiting you from creating more of the product. Don't think too chemically about this. And what I mean by that is, you probably do a limiting reactant problem every day if you cook or bake at all. You look into your fridge or pantry and you say, what do I have enough of? What, you know, if, you want, if you're wanting to make uh, pancakes and you only have, you know, a half a cup of milk, well, that's going to limit you from making any more pancakes. So all of your pancakes are going to be dependent upon how much milk you have. Even if you have a million eggs and a million cups of flour, if you don't have any milk, um, you can't make um, any more pancakes than that allows you to make. Okay, so I hope this cleared up some of your confusion. Let me know if you have any additional questions. And um, best of luck on the test.